Sorry. Yeah? I just have to get a line on All right. I'll sit down so I don't trip on the way up. That would be embarrassing. Oh. <laughs> All right, let's go ahead and get started, I guess. Right, we're ready to go? Cool. Well, for those of you who are here, I guess you survived uh, night one at the con. Congratulations. Uh, we just have a few announcements before we get started. Uh, there have been a few items that have been turned into lost and found, so if you're missing something or you no longer have your phone or something, go ahead and check in with registration, and if you can identify the item, you should be able to get it back. Uh, also, for those of you who are not aware, uh, we are selling uh, bags of crap at registration. And uh, they're just grab bags of prizes. And there's uh, different sizes, depending on how much you want to donate to a good cause. Um, I also, before we get started, uh, for those of you who sat close, I have a few giveaways. So if uh, anybody wants a shirt from last year, and I also have a, a moose to give away. Uh, there's a lot of people. Those are nice throws. Thank you, thank you. Uh, all right, let's go ahead and get uh, started with uh, our first talk of this morning. Um, it's on uh, uh, cockroach analysis by uh, David Dorsey. David. So I imagine the title gives you how I feel about these files. Um, so, like I said, I'm David Dorsey. Um, I'm currently at Click Security in Austin. Been on the defensive side for a while now. Um, standard stuff I've been working on over the years. And I started to do data analysis and machine learning a couple years ago. Um, so, why did you guys wake up early to come see me? That's a good question. But what I'm here to talk about is how you can take you know, a large amount of data and turned it into information you can act on. Um, we're going to, you know, it gives you starting places to uh, hunt and find new, interesting, and hopefully unknown malicious files. It doesn't rely on easy to avoid signatures. And so it's essentially heuristics on, you know, non-trivial boundaries in high dimensional space. We're talking, in some cases, up towards 90 different uh, tributes we're going to be looking at. Um, so first we're going to talk about uh, the tools I use to do this. Um, that'll be quick. A um, little bit of vocabulary so everyone hopefully understands what I'm talking about. And then we're going to jump into the Java and Swift analysis. And I'll take you through the iterative process of exploring the data, extracting features, testing them out, and you know, seeing how we, uh, how we do. And then we'll wrap it up and then you guys can ask me questions. So first off, um, we used IPython to, uh, you know, do our analysis. Um, it's a great tool, it's interactive, browser-based, it's easy to share your results with others. I actually have two IPoth IPython notebooks um, that you can get to now um, to look at the, the data. You can see the methodology we use. IPython is a great way to show other people exactly the process you used. And I think that's important so other people can go, okay, I can see what you did. Here's where you did wrong or here's where I think you could have done better. It's a good collaborative pretty much kind of like an awesome version of a, an array of dictionaries. It gives you a great way to slice and dice your data. Um, matplotlib, just an easy way to create graphs and plots. Um, all the, uh, most of the graphs you'll see in the presentation, I created these. Um, the code's really easy to use. If you look at the notebooks, you'll see how easy it is. Um, Scikit-learn, it's uh, machine learning in Python. It makes things really easy. It unfortunately doesn't support data frames, but it's super easy to go from a data frame to something scikit-learn can use. So data science, it's everyone's favorite buzzword. Um, so what really is it? Well, I think it's you know, asking your data questions and then hopefully getting actionable information from it. Um, to properly do this, you, know, you need someone with subject matter expertise, um, someone's really good in statistical analysis, someone to write the code to do all this. Um, to find that in, in just one person is like finding a unicorn. Um, fortunately for me, scikit-learn pretty much took care of the uh, coding and the math side of things, so I just had to provide the subject matter expertise. So I'm definitely not a unicorn. 
Um, ground truth, it's essentially the accuracy in your labels. Um, ideally, you want 100% accuracy. Um, and it's not always easy to get, but because it can be time consuming. But as, if you have uh, crap data going into your algorithm, you're going to have crap information coming out. Um, bias and variance. Bias is, you know, error is essentially the errors and the assumptions in, the, in your um, algorithm. Um, kind of like the example I'm showing on the dartboard, it's kind of like just always being off from the bullseye, assuming bullseye is your target. Um, variance is just the kind of the sensitivity to the to your training set. Um, in the dartboard example, if you have high variance, you're hitting all over the board. Low variance, you're hitting all in one spot. Um, a high bias can lead to underfitting the data where you don't match the data very well. And um, high variance can cause overfitting the data where you try too hard to fit the data. And here's two quick examples of that. Um, the one on the left is um, high bias. It's kind of an extreme example where it doesn't care about the data. It's just that red line and you can see the data there. And then um, the high variance is the one on the right. You see it's trying really hard to, to fit every exact point on, its, on the graph rather than trying to just get the nice smooth blue line where it's, you know, the, uh, you know a good approximation of your data. Um, so I'll be showing lots of box plots. It's a great way to display the distribution of your data. Um, the middle line is the median point, and the box contains the 50% of your data. And then the whiskers there contains the other quarters on each side. Cross-validation. It's a technique for seeing how well your uh, data will do on, a, on an independent set. You randomly partition the data, you train on one set, and then you test on the other, and then you repeat k times. In our notebooks, um, when we uh, do cross-validation, we randomly select 80% of the data to train on, and then test on the other 20%. And we do this 10 times to make sure that we just didn't get a lucky training set. Decision trees. They're kind of a flowchart-like structure where each node represents a test you can do on your data, and then each branch is the outcome of that um, answer. Um, the example here, I think, is one of the classic Titanic, if you survived the Titanic. And you know, if you were male, no, then you have a better then you might have survived at a higher rate. And it's just, you know, f you know, flow chart, and it's fra fairly simple. Uh, random force is the uh, algorithm we used. Um, it's a randomly gr group of decision trees. We selected it because it's, it's pretty good at controlling variance and not overfitting your data. And um, the classification answer we get from it is the. Uh, and the label that appears most frequently. Since in each of our, my examples, I only use two labels, 50% is our threshold, so if more than that, then that's your label. So the data, we have about 300,000 uncompressed Swift files and 370,000 Java class files. Um, and this is where you can uh, get your IPython notebooks. Um, we have a data hacking repo uh, on GitHub, I click. And it's where we put all of our various notebooks that we find interesting from different presentations. There's uh, much more than just the two notebooks I'll talk about on there. Um, it's, you can get the data, play with it, and then contact us. You know, if, you, if you think we could do something better, we'd love to know. And if you think we did something wrong, well, we'd also love to know that too. We, I, by no means do I think this is uh, the end all be all, but it's just a, it's a, it's a good way to go about doing things. So Java, so I don't really want to get bogged down in the uh, nitty gritty of the format, but there's lots of information you can get from the file. I mean, simple things like version, class name, uh, the constant pools where, amazingly, it contains the constants in the file, strings, method names, your access flags or the permissions and the properties of the class, um, and the methods is obviously the, you know, the actual code. Um, so those 370,000 class files, they're probably all benign. I don't have labels for them. I'm, from where we got the data, um, I'm just assuming they're all benign, but it's quite possible that there's some malicious ones in there. And then I have 2,000 known malicious ones, and I verified that um, by uploading all of them to VirusTotal, and I think 
I made sure they had at least, I don't know, 10 detections. Um, but it's a lot of data to start with. So we first start off with just grabbing 500 needs. It's manageable. And uh, you can get, hopefully, broad strokes about your data. And then you can apply it to the larger set. So the first thing we did is look at the file size. And you can see they're usually fairly small. The malicious ones, you know, maybe they're a little bit bigger. But if, let's, if you look closer down at where the, most of the data is, you can actually see that, yeah, OK, the malicious ones on average are maybe a little bit bigger. Um, so that's, you know, that could be interesting, useful information. Next, we look at entropy. Um, we're looking at the entropy over the entire file. Um, maybe we need a better idea would be to look at entropy in certain sections, but right now we just did it over the entire file. And you can see that, you know, the malicious ones, a little bit higher entropy. Um, next, we looked at the number of items in the constant pool. Just, and uh, you can see that, you know, the malicious ones can have some really high amounts, but most of the data is crammed there at the bottom. So if we zoom in on that, you can see, yeah, okay, the malicious ones tend to have a little bit more. Um, next, we look at the uh, number of methods. You know, maybe it's a, there's a lot of overlap here. Probably not uh, a good way to distinguish between the two. Um, yeah. Then we look at the number of interfaces. Yeah, so they're pretty much almost always zero. You know, pretty much all the features you extract, they're, they're not all winners. Some of them aren't better than others. So we take this information and a few others. We make our first pass classifier. You know, we get, we talk, we grab the uh, data we just talked about. We grab them versions, the number of access flag set, that sort of thing, and then we throw it to random forest, and we run cross validation, and we got 92, you know, about 92, 93 percent. You know, with a fairly big margin of error. You know, it's not bad. It's not great either by any stretch of the imagination. But, you know, we just, this, we just used the data that we could really quickly get. And, uh, you know, 93% isn't horrible for that. Um, we can look at the data a little bit further, break down the numbers. Um, again, when we uh, create this diagram here, we grab 80% of the data to train on, and then we test on the 20% of the data. And you can see here if the false negative and false positive rates are about the uh, same. Um, so we know that you know, it works equally well on the labels. It's not really great at labeling you know, benign files and you know, fairly poor at malicious. It's, they're about equal. Um, so the next thing we want to know is, well, how important were those features? And so we can have uh, the algorithm, so we can have random forest tell us which, which, which uh, features were more important than the others. And you can see the entropy, the constant pool size, and the file size were the most important ones. And that kind of makes sense. We saw the box plots, and we saw the, the um, distribution of the data that way. And then the other ones, you know, they, they start falling off as not as important. Um, so look, like, OK, this makes sense. This is, this is useful information for us. Um, but clearly, we, we need more features. And there's still plenty more to get from the file. Um, we have method names and attributes. We still have the class name, super class name. Um, so, but first, we'll look at the method names, because that, you know, could be interesting, you know. And so we look at the benign ones. Yeah, these all look right. Okay, they look, they look normal. And then you look at the malicious ones. And some look okay, and, you know, some look like my two-year-old son was in front of the keyboard and typed them out. And so, like, oh, so clearly those look bad. But random force requires you to have a number inputted into the algorithm, so we can't exactly input text to it. So how do we extract, what features do we extract from that text that we can convert into numbers? To do that, we took some inspiration from a spam filter. Um, some of the features they, the spam filter we looked at had was the length of consecutive lowercase letters and uppercase letters and digits. So we, so we was like, okay, let's try that. And we took the max length from all the method names and then the average length of all the sequences of those. And we wanted to explore those. So then, so we look at the lowercase letters. Eh, you know, if it's really high, it's probably more malicious, but there's a lot of overlap. Same thing with average length of lowercase letters. If you look at uppercase, same thing. Average length again, same thing. You know, it's a little disappointing. Digits, it's almost always zero. 
both average and stuff. And so well, we use that information. We throw it to our cross-validation again. We have a slight improvement. It's still in the margin of error. So I don't even know. Maybe this is good. Maybe this is bad. Or, or not as good. Maybe not necessarily bad. But it wasn't as hopeful. It wasn't as good as I had hoped it would be. And then if we break down the numbers again, um, again, you can see that it, it works equally well on both the malicious and benign. It doesn't favor one label over the other. Um, if we check out the importance again, still the first three are the same as the last time. And that's no surprise because we didn't see a lot of uh, separation with the method names. But so clearly we, we need more, we need more features and we still have, you know, still plenty of more features. So the next up we're going to look at the class name. So we first start off with the, the benign class names. Look at them, yeah, okay, you know, they look okay, normal words, they, maybe they're, they're pretty long, there's lots of slashes, okay, that's, that's about what we can, you know, look at it. And then if we look at the malicious ones, like, okay, my son was uh, typing these out again, and, you know, they're fairly short, not many slashes, okay, so maybe, the, maybe we have some good features there. And so that's the features we extract, the length, the number of slashes, and then we do the, uh, the spam filter, um, uh, features again. And so we look at that. So when we look at the class name, some fairly good separation. The malicious one's much shorter. Look at the slash, malicious ones, almost no slashes, some one, and the good ones, the benign ones, usually have slashes. So there's some good separation there. Then we look at the lowercase letters. Okay, now we're starting to get some separation there, so that's good. That's uh, encouraging. Um, same thing with the average run. So we do a cross-validation again. Hey, it looks like it might actually be useful. We got 99.4%. So let's break down the numbers. We run it, uh, the confusion matrix on again, and look, it told us we were perfect. Now, if you believe that, well, can I go work for you? Um, so there's some things we still want to play with here. So those, there's knobs you can turn with random fours. Um, like I said before, by default, it's, you know, it's whatever uh, label was over 50% is what, it's what, what we labeled the data. But you can change that. So you can increase the threshold to decrease the false positive rate. It comes at a price of a lower detection, of course, but you know, if, you, if you're worried about false positives, you can, you can handle that. You can also decrease the threshold to increase the true positive rate. So maybe if you just want to definitely filter out the good ones, um, and you know, be okay with you know some benign ones you know passing through for further inspection later on. You can decrease it. So we wanted to play with the data a little bit, and so we set the threshold to 80 percent. So 80 percent of the uh, trees had to say this file was malicious for us to call it malicious. And we did that, and we still had actually surprisingly good results. We only uh, misidentified three of them. So that was encouraging. So then we wanted to flip that. Let's set it down to 20%. So only 20% of the trees had to say, yes, this file is malicious. And we actually only misclassified one of the benign files. So that was also encouraging. So what that means is our algorithm was actually fairly confident of its label. Um, here's the distribution of all the scores from that. And you can see that, yes, they're either way on the left or way on the right. Um, so it's, it, the algorithm's very sure. So now we want to check out the feature importance again. And you can see, you know, I think I have eight there, and six of them are, uh, might be nine, are, almost all of them are based off of the class name. So this is, you know, good and bad. It's good because, you know, we seem to get good results from it. It's bad in the sense that we might be overly reliant on one particular feature, so if an attacker, you know, happens to change their behavior on that particular field, our great classifier now turns into a very useless one. But that's a future problem. So how does it work on the uh, 366,000 files um, that we have? So it ran it, 340,000 of them were marked as clean, which I said is less than, uh, less than 50% of the trees marked it as uh, malicious. 11,000 were um, in this, what I call a gray area, where 50 to 80% of the trees marked it as malicious. 
and then 15,000 were malicious, which is 80% of the trees or more. And that's fairly horrible. I mean, I totally don't think 15,000 of these files were malicious. It's, it was kind of disappointing, but really it's, 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 it's Diago. It's not really that, a, that big a surprise. We started with only 500 of each. That's really not enough data. So let's use more data. So we created a new classifier. Um, we had 2,000 uh, maliciously labeled ones, so we used all 2,000 of that. And then we uh, took 2,000 of the uh, files we were testing on, randomly selected 2,000 of those, and uh, marked them as benign. And then we uh, ran cross-validation on it, and we got a 99% again. You know, so that much like before, or the 500 uh, file classifier, but now with much more data. Um, check out the confusion matrix. Again, it looks good, you know, high, um, equal, equally good on benign and malicious. And then <coughs> we run it on the rest of the files. Now, the first time through, you know, it was, these, this result was actually a little surprising to me. The um, malicious ones went way down. Now we're less than a thousand. So that's almost down to a reasonable number, you know, over the course, you know, collecting a files over the course of a year and a half. But you have that 64,000 in the gray area. That was surprisingly large. Um, I'm not sure why it was so high yet, but, you know, it, it, was, it was high. But since I didn't quite like the results, I want to say, okay, maybe it was just a poor training set. And so I took another random 2,000 files or, and tried it again. This one I got a much better result. And so only a little bit over 3,000 files were in the gray area and then a little bit over 1,000 in the malicious area. And they're still high and so clearly I think the classifier needs more work, but it was much happier, I was much happier with this result than the one with the 60,000 gray. And then I ran it again another random 2,000 files and um, got similar results to the second run. Um, so you can see that that first, that first run with the 60 some odd thousand uh, gray areas, there was something interesting in that training set. Um, maybe it was a poor set and, uh, but you know, this is just stuff you, this is just information you can get from your data that you can, you know, when you play with it. So, to sum up the Java section, you know, we, we can det detect malicious files using, you know, using data science. Um, clearly that we still need to do more work, but, you know, we've, we just started on this recently and, you know, we're, we're getting fairly good results, I think. Um, there's variability in my data, obviously, um, so, but we have it, so we can train on more of it. We need more data and um, we end up with a classifier that's fairly good at classifying class names. So next up, you know, more malicious files, better labeled data, you know. I just assumed those 2,000 files were benign. I should probably verify that. Um, you know, we start just simple labels, good, you know, good, bad, but we can probably get, you know, more sophisticated labels like the exploit, exploit kit or the uh, CV number that it uses. And then, you know, hopefully, you know, extract features that can maybe label that too. Um, then we still need to extract, you know, more features from the file itself, uh, more information about the method and class names, um, more features about the methods, maybe, you know, an actual look at the bytecode, maybe an ingram analysis of it. There's lots of stuff we could do still, and that's just, you know, it's, it's, it's coming up next. You know, it's what we have to do next. So now we'll switch gears and go over to uh, Flash. Um, so I have in a little under 300,000 uh, Swift files. They were all uncompressed. If I had them compressed, I uncompressed them and got rid of them, got rid of the compressed version. Um, I only had 628 malicious files. Um, that was smaller than I wanted, but I was limited by the, what I could find. Um, so like before, I start with 500 of the benign ones and I just grabbed all of the malicious ones because you know, I was normally going to do 500 of it, but, you know, what's the difference between 500 and a little over 600? Um, again, I used uh, virus total to verify that the malicious ones were malicious and that the benign ones were benign. Um, so the Swift file highlights, you know, you have the 
in the header you have the version, the, you know, the information about the size of the, the Swift on the screen, the frame size, um, the rate, and number of frames in it. And then, you know, there's tons of tags in the, uh, that's how, you know, Swifts are divvied up. Everything's in a uh, specific tag. And so there's, you know, any number of tags and it's supposed to end with an end tag. Um, so we looked at that and we, so we wanted to see what versions were we seeing, you know, and then were they malicious or benign? And, you know, most of the malicious ones seem to be uh, version 9. Um, that's not terribly surprising to me because that's when Action Script 3 was introduced into Swifts. And that's kind of like your JavaScript for Swifts, and so made it easier for attackers. Um, but, you know, it's overall, it's a lot, you know, there's a lot of equal, you know, equal amounts. Um, I mean, as in, you know, for like 10, it seems to be about equal on benign and malicious files. So, not a lot, I think, we can uh, really read into that from this. Um, we look at the file size again. You know, there's a lot of overlap here. So I didn't think this was, you know, a good separator. Um, entropy, you know, actually this was a little surprising that the malicious ones were, had less entropy. I'm used to thinking that the more entropy something has, it's bad, but that wasn't the case in this one, so that was interesting to me. Um, frame count, um, see that most of them were, uh, the benign ones were really low. I mean, you don't even see a box. That's how many were really low. And as it turns out, almost all of them just had a frame count of one. And then frame rate. You know, a lot of overlap. You know, it doesn't look like a good separation of data here. Same thing with the area of the frame. You know, it's a lot of overlap. Again, with the perimeter, a lot of overlap. Maybe the small perimeters are more associated with malicious, but you know, it's, you know, I, I got this and I was like, you know, this is gonna be the, my first pass classifier. I'm thinking it's gonna be horrible. But I did a cross validation and it was 96%. It was surprisingly good. Um, probably artificially good. Um, but I was, uh, I was quite surprised by that because I didn't think I had good information there. But the algorithm tells me it did. So I'm gonna trust it over, me, my, over, that, over myself. So we break the numbers down again. Um, you know, it's about, about the same as uh, the Java classifier. You know, it's, it's pretty good at labeling benign and malicious both equally well. Um, check out the feature importance. Entropy was the highest, and that makes sense because looking at the box plots, that was probably the best separator. Um, so, you know, I think we could do better, so we tried. So we, we have all that tag information. Um, a tag can exist multiple times in the file, but we only take into consideration that it does exist. So if it exists 10 times or one time, we don't care. We just say it exists in the, tag, in the file. And then an end tag should be the last tag. So check that out. So the number of tags. So this is, might be good. So you can see the malicious ones, they typically have a small number of tags in the file. And the benign ones, there's a very big spread and some can be extremely large. So then we break down, let's look at you know, individual tags, see if any of them seem to favor one uh, label over the other. Um, place object two, just one of the tags that jumped out at us. Um, you know, if it does have one, it's probably benign, but you know, there's a few with malicious, so that's, you know, that's some interesting information. Um, do ABC, that's um, the tag for action script. Um, it's not surprising that a lot of the malicious ones have it, but you know a lot of benign ones have it too. So it's you know it's not that great. Um, then there's the do ABC define. That's apparently the deprecated way to do action script. Um, so not I think there's one or two benign ones that had it, um, and but and only a few malicious ones. But if you do have the tag, you know it definitely looks like you would be malicious versus benign. Um, Again, uh, just another tag that, if, you know, if we saw that, you know, if you had this tag, you were likely benign, but, you know, most of them don't have the tag. So this is where the high dimensional space and the weird decision boundaries come into effect because, you know, there's, there's a lot of different variability in all these. Um, and then the uh, end tag. 
Um, so every file, I think, according to the spec, is required to have one. But apparently, the, it's much more forgiving than that. So most of the, uh, most, all, almost all of them had in tags. But if you didn't, you're more likely to be malicious, though even some of the blind ones just didn't have an in tag. So we took all this information. So we had the number of tags, and I think there's some 80-odd tag uh, distance that we threw in there. And we did cross-validation. And you know we got pretty much the same results as before. It was fairly disappointing. Um, but you know, it's just the way it goes sometimes. You know, sometimes you think you have a great idea, and you add it in, you do the work, and see the results, and you're like, oh, that's, that, that makes me sad. Um, breaking down the, uh, the uh, numbers again, like before, it's equally well labeling each class. Um, maybe, a, maybe there was a slight improvement, but it's within the margin of errors. It was fairly disappointing. Um, look at the feature, important, feature importance again. Well, the number of tags, you know, that jumped up. You know, it showed up relatively high on it, but not enough to really make a difference in our overall results. Um, so then, you know, based on experience, we know that I know that ActionScript, you know, is used a lot for malicious, you know, you know, in malicious files. So I wanted to say, okay, maybe we can, maybe there's some uh, de features there we can get that might help us, you know, identify malicious ones. Um, so ActionScript, brief overview, um, you know, it allows Flash to be interactive. There's multiple versions. I, th I think they're on the third version right now. The ActionScript itself is similar, st structured similarly to a Java class file in the sense that there's a constant pool, a section for methods and attributes. And I really, really, really hate the ActionScript file format. There's variable length, um, fields that you so you have to do a bunch of bit ma manipulation. I, I I don't know I don't know why why it exists. I hate it. So anyways, the data. So we looked at the number of strings that are in the action script. Um, you know, that was you know, it was disappointing. A lot of overlap. If you have a lot of strings, you're much more likely to be benign. But eh, you know, it was. It was there was, there was a lot of overlap, so it was like, ah, oh, not much there, maybe. I mean, at least looking at it this way, I, I don't have a lot of hope. Um, then we looked at the mean to median string length ratio, so you take the average length of all the strings and the median length of all the strings and divide that. Um, and typically a higher ratio there is, uh, means it's more suspicious. And that's because, you know, in, in these cases, you know, you have a bunch of short strings, and then you have a very long string that's uh, the shell code, and then that long stri string throws off the average length, but it doesn't really affect the median length that much. Um, so we want to look at that. And so there, well, we do have some decent separation there. Um, you notice that the benign ones are really close to zero there. Um, that's because all the uh, files that had no action script get you know, a value of zero assigned to them there. So they're kind of anchored down a little bit just because of that. Um, so we did the cross-validation on those. Maybe a tiny bit of improvement, but still not near as much as I would have liked. 97%. Um, I mean, we're not talking bad, but you know, I would have, I had, I had hoped at least that we were going going to do much better. Breaking down the numbers again, I think this was a particularly uh, good training set. That's why it's, you know, above the 97%. But again, it's equally well about labeling benign and malicious. Um, we check out the feature importance. We see the string count there at the you know in the in the top ones, but none of the other action script ones, you know, did a, you know were particularly useful or high in in importance. So let's test it on the on those two hundred ninety thousand files. So we did that, and eight thousand were in that gray area, and uh, two thousand were marked as malicious. I thought it was way better than I thought it was going to be, honestly. <laughs> Judging by the by our cross validation results, I thought. This was way better than our, the Java one on the first try. And again, we only used a small set of files. So maybe we'll get better results with uh, you know, training on more data. So this time we ch I chose 50, 000, uh, not 50, 5,000 uh, files from the uh, large corpus and set them as benign. And I ran cross-validation again. This time 99%, very, in a very small uh, mark, 
margin of error. So I was like, wow, that's, that's much better. I'm, at the, I'm, I'm actually now hopeful. I'm breaking down the numbers. You know, it looks good equally well on both benign and malicious. Um, check out the feature importance. You know, much like um, the uh, smaller classifier, it's, you know, same feature importance. So now let's run it again. Run it again. You know, now we're, you know, fairly decent results, I think. And maybe even manageable results. I mean, so 400 plus files marked as malicious, you know, a little under 700 in the gray area. Considering we, you know, gathered these files over the course of over a year, you know, assuming an equal distribution of the files per day, you know, it's almost a manageable number for an analyst to look at. That's not bad. Um, so then we had the idea of, all right, we have all this information on action script that we added to our classifier. What if, and it shouldn't, it shouldn't mean anything to any of the files that don't have action script, so let's limit our file set to just the ones with action script. We run cross-validation again, and it's 99%. Well, you know, it's just, it's just like a, the classifier that, you know, didn't care that, that we had a, a non-action script files in it. So like, okay, well, well maybe we'll, let's check it out in large corpus. That usually gives us some good information. Um, we had 153,000 of those. Um, most were marked as benign, only a small set for gray and, uh, and malicious. But percentage-wise, you know, it really didn't bias anything. It's the same amount, you know, the uh, same percentage of each section were, or each label was kind of as the, uh, the non-specific uh, uh, classifier. So that was surprising to me, honestly. I thought that, you know, if we focused one on just a, a classifier for uh, Swift files with uh, action script, that would be better than one, the one classifier to rule them all, but it clearly was not the case. Um, so in summary, we, again, we can detect, detect malicious files using data science. This classifier isn't overly dependent on any one feature, which is kind of nice because in the Java one, if they change just one feature, they'd probably defeat it. In this one, they would have to de change their behavior much more. Um, you know, creating separate classifiers for specific sets of uh, Swift files you know, didn't help us at all. And the classifier performed fairly well on the random set of files. I, I was happy about that. So next up, of course, more malicious files. That 600 really doesn't cut it. I mean, we, I need more. Um, like the Java, better label data, um, not just good, bad, exploit kits, CVE, anything else you could think of as a possible label could be good. Um, I think, I still think we can extract more action script features, maybe some, you know, ngram analysis again or a gtest analysis on the methods called. Um, there's, there's lots of more information we can extract and play with and hopefully, you know, increase our results. So our highlights from today. Um, so we can use data science to detect new malicious files. That's great. Um, and it's without signatures, so it's not just, you know, we're not just changing one simple string or a set of bytes um, to, to avoid it. It's, it's much harder. They're going to have to change their behavior, which is harder to do than just changing a simple line, of, you know, line or a sequence of bytes. The Java classifier is heavily dependent on one, one feature. Again, that's good and bad. It's good because, you know, it worked really well. It's bad because once they change that, it's going to not work really well. The Swift one, you know, uh, it was good on, it was not dependent on one particular feature or highly dependent. Um, and so that way, to, to avoid that one, you're going to have to change a lot more things. And we see the more data we trained with, the better the results were. Uh, at some point, I'm assuming there's a diminishing returns, but I don't think I'm there yet. Um, so, and I mean, so we're really seeing this is a fairly useful method of uh, of talking with your data. Not to say that this is ready to go and you can just do all this and put it out in production. You're going to have to figure out how to productionize it and you know enable it for to your analysts to use. But it's you know, it's, it's stuff you can do. It's, you know, it's relatively easy to do. The IPython notebooks can w walk you through a lot of the, the steps we took and, 
there, you know, there's, we're, we're sharing it, so there's, there's no harm in, you know, playing copy and pasting. We know we, we, we borrow from ourselves. Um, some things you want to try to avoid. I don't like, you know, being over-reliant on that one feature. Um, you know, it's, I, I, I think that I, sh especially in the Java case, that there's more features to look at that I think will be hopefully just as useful. So that way we're not overly reliant. Um, and the other thing I think, you know, it's hard to avoid is sometimes you think you have this great feature and you really want it to work well and then it doesn't. And then you're like banging your head against it, trying to get it to work, or maybe it's this, maybe it's that, and then you're just wasting a lot of time. Just, you know, pretty much trust, you know, trust, trust your data. If it's telling you it's not good, even though you really love it, um, just, just move on. It's, it's not always easy and, you know, it can be frustrating, but, you know, otherwise you're just wasting even more time. And then uh, test on a lot of data. You know, if we had stopped on the, without, on the Java class files without uh, testing on that large corpus, you would have thought it was great. But then when we ran it on the large corpus, you saw that it wasn't near as good as we thought it was. Um, so where do we go from here? Oh, well, obviously, we need more data. Um, verify our data is, are, is labeled appropriately. Um, more sophisticated labels, like I was mentioning, the exploit kit, you know, where, if it came from, or the CVEs. And then extract more features. It's, you know, there's a lot more data we can get from the files, so we should get it and see how it, how it, how it works. Um, and you, like I said, you can play at home. Um, you can go uh, to this site, our GitHub repo, to uh, get the notebooks, and there's a lot of other notebooks, too, if you want. Um, the, three, the information from the 300,000 files was relatively large. I didn't think GitHub would really like me uploading, you know, 200 megabit files. Um, so if you really want that data, I'm happy to share it with you, but we'll, you'll have to contact me to get it. Um, you can contact me on Twitter. There's my email address. And all the links you probably can't really read, um, if you look at the slides later, they're just um, links to uh, a lot of the references I used. So on that note, any questions? We'll go up close first. Are you going to post these slides somewhere? Uh, sure. I, don't, I think the conference will, but if not, I'll post them and I'll send out a link to where they are at. Yes, yeah, so I think actually in the, which one? I want to say the Java class. In the notebook itself, I also used, um, it was like the extra trees random forest. So it's like random forest, but even more random. And then I used an SVM as well. And I got similar, similar results. I didn't run them on the entire corpus, but it was just something to play with. And that's probably one of the things I should have mentioned. I used random forest because I'm most familiar with it, um, but by no means is that do I think that's definitely the right one to use. There's, I am you know, I'm all about using whatever one works the best. Don't think there's like a good definition, but the numbers next to the the uh, features that are used gave you the 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 weight the algorithm used, and I think if I th I want to say the ones from the class name were up to over 80 percent, and just intuitively that just seems high to me. I mean, it's that's I it's just intuition at that point. Um, yeah, so, you know, random force is an ensemble one, but I think it's just the, the fact that I had so much variance was, I think, just my training set, and I just randomly s selected, a, uh, I think, a bad 2000 for uh, the benign. Um, but since I have the files, I really think I, I probably should have done, like, maybe 10,000 files to train on, or maybe 50,000, and that would still leave me a lot to, to test on. 
and I think just more data will help control the var variance there. Actually, I wasn't looking over here. Any of I think that is it then. Thank you. <laughs>